This is a competition, monopoly, and antitrust in 45 minutes. And, uh, and so what I'm going to do is uh, compare um, the Austrian view of uh, competition, the theory of competition, with the uh, sort of the mainstream view, the theory of perfect competition that was developed in the 20th century, and also talk about the implications of this, th these differences in, uh, in uh, outlooks of what competition is to antitrust policy or anti-monopoly policy. And this is my definition, my, my version of the Austrian definition of the meaning of competition. Competition is a dynamic, rivalrous process of entrepreneurial discovery. And this is basically how anybody who studied, researched, and wrote about competition in, in the economics literature thought of it from, from before Adam Smith until about the 1930s in, 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 um, in the world, all throughout the world. Competition meant, just look at the word, it's dynamic, it's ongoing, it's not a static situation, it's not an equilibrium, in other words. It's rivalrous, and what does that mean? Well, it means price cutting, advertising, product differentiation, uh, mergers, all these things that we see businesses doing, and, and, and they, they create new techniques of competing every single day. And so, and, and this is rivalry, and uh, you know it's a process, it's an ongoing process of entrepreneurial discovery. Uh, even, for example, even in the literature on mergers, um, there there's a school of thought that there there is something such an idea as the optimal size of a firm, and there are all sorts of theories to tell you what this optimal size would be, and they're in the textbooks. But really, the only the only way to know what the optimal size of a firm is, meaning the most profitable is trial and error in the marketplace. So the, the market reveals to us, the market process reveals to us this information, such as the optimal size of firm of the firm. Uh, you know, the market participants discover these things, but these things are all assumed to exist in, uh, under the so-called perfect competition model. That's why Friedrich Hayek, uh, the one article I recommended on the reading list, said in his famous article, The Meaning of Competition, which is online, and if you're interested in this particular area of Austrian economics, you should read that article. Uh, I remember when I was a student and I first ran across this article, I must have read it 20 times because because Hayek is not the easiest person to read for one, for one thing. And so, uh, but I, I knew this was a very important article, so I, I can remember reading it over and over and over again to make sure I understood what the heck he was saying about it. But maybe it's just because I had a low IQ. But uh, and you might you might take five minutes and it'd be okay. But but he had this famous line that in perfect competition there is no competition, which is absolutely true. You know you know. And so, but at the time at the at around the late 19th, early 20th century, when we had the first antitrust laws, the first anti-monopoly laws in the United States, the first one in the United States was the Sherman Act, uh, named, named after Senator John Sherman the, in the year 1890. There were state antitrust laws before that, but this was the first one. Sherman was the brother of the famous Civil War general, uh, Sherman. He was senator from Ohio. But at the time, a co-author and I uh, surveyed uh, what what the uh, the economics profession of the day was saying about this about this the, the fact that there were there were merger there was a merger wave in the late 19th century in the United States and we had this anti monopoly law which is really was an anti merger law at the, at the time the Sherman Antitrust Act and uh, my my co author at the time was Jack High we published this article in the, the journal Economic Inquiry way back when like 1988. In ancient history, I was only five years old at the time when this was when this was published. But we surveyed the entire economics profession of the day of the, that day, and that might not that might sound like kind of crazy uh, today. But there was an article by an, uh, an economist named A. W. Coates in the American Economic Review, who determined that there were only ten there were only ten people who earned a living at the time as as professional economists, and it was called the American Economics Club. And uh, and so and they were all like the founder of the Wharton School of Finance and a few people at the University of Chicago, University of Pennsylvania, and, uh, Columbia, uh, people of that sort, where the economics profession was just getting started in the late 19th century. And here are some of the things they said about this, about this merger wave that was the, the ostensible reason for the Sherman Act. Herbert Davenport, sort of the founder of the University of Chicago uh, Economics Department in 1919. 
uh, that only a few firms in an industry where there are economies of scale, it does not require the elimination of competition. So they were they were all saying that uh, you know they weren't worried about these mergers because they were seeing the mergers happening, and industrial concentration was increasing, but they saw prices going down year after year after year. Product new products coming on the market, and they're improving the quality of the products. That was Herbert Davenport. James Lachlan of Chicago said, when a combination is large, a rival combination may give the most spirited competition. Uh, E.R.A. Seligman, another old uh, figure in the history of economic thought, uh, he said that without large-scale production, the world would revert to a more primitive state of well-being and would virtually renounce the inestimable benefits of the best utilization of capital. Simon Patton, the founder of the Wharton School, said that the combination of capital does not cause any economic disadvantage to the community at all. Combinations are much more efficient than were the small producers whom they displaced. He's talking about the benefits of economies of scale through merger. And so what, what Jack High and I found at the time was that the economics profession, such as it was, was pretty much unanimously opposed in principle to the whole idea of antitrust regulation. They didn't say, we don't like this law, I would have a different kind of law. They said that antitrust, uh, antitrust law was per se inherently incompatible with competition. And we argue in this paper that the, the main reason for that was that they viewed competition then, like the Austrians always have viewed competition and who've, how they view it today as a, a dynamic, rivalrous process of entrepreneurial discovery. And they were noticing that this new thing, this merger wave in the, in the, in the newly industrialized America was leading to good things, expansion of production, uh, declining prices, new products, better quality products, more employment. And this was going on for, for a long, long time, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. So they didn't see uh, this as a, as a problem. And, and by the way, I wrote down a few books. If you want to follow up in, in this whole area, here's a little bit of reading. Uh, one of my favorites is an old classic by Dom Armentano, Antitrust and Monopoly. The essay by Hayek, The Meaning of Competition. Chapter 10 of Man, Economy, and State on Competition and Monopoly. And if you, I'm going to talk about industrial concentration and all these studies that were done over the years of the link between industrial concentration or mergers and uh, profitability and competitiveness. And an old, I consider this an old classic too, Yale Brosen, Concentration, Mergers, and Public Policy. It's a, it's a really nice piece of economic history, work of economic history. I think it was published in the early 80s, but but if you want to understand the, the, the history of economic thought aspect of, uh, of the, the, this transformation in the theory of monopoly, that's a good book to read. And this was all eclipsed. This, this type of thinking was eclipsed by the perfect competition model that came into being. In the, I, I put it in the 1930s, in the 1930s. And in uh, Frank Knight's famous book, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, I think he was the first or among the first to just lay it all out, with what perfect competition meant. And he, Knight is known for other things, his theory of risk and so forth. But also in that book, it, it was this was sort of a new thing, that, that this new theory of competition that, that the economics profession embraced in the 1930s. And all of a sudden, competition no longer meant uh, rivalrous uh, discovery and entrepreneurship. It meant these things. It meant this, these are the things that Hayek refers to when he says perfect competition, there's no competition. Many firms, homogeneous, these are the standard assumptions that, that were in all the textbooks of what constitutes a perfectly competitive industry. Homogeneous products, homogeneous prices, perfect information, free entry and exit. There, there are a few other ones depending on which textbook you look at, certainly today. You know, so this is, I'm speaking sort of historically here for now about when, when this uh, uh, came into being. And so, uh, and so the idea of these assumptions was the theory was only sp supposed to primarily explain price competition. So you hold product quality constant. That way you don't have to deal with uh, quality competition. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna assume that away because we're gonna focus. And then they you, they develop this competitive model that you, if you've ever taken microeconomics, you've gone through the whole business of of the competitive model. 
And, uh, you know, uh, Robert Bork, uh, who taught, um, you know, he was a federal judge. He, he taught uh, antitrust law at Yale Law School for many years. Yeah, he was actually uh, the teacher of Bill and Hillary Clinton at Yale Law School. They took, they took his, uh, his um, antitrust course. But he wrote a book called The Antitrust Parado Paradox, uh, which is a, a pretty good critique of antitrust. And he's, it was not, he's never considered himself to be an Austrian, but a lot of his arguments were very Austrian like in, in this book, The Antitrust Paradox. My favorite line in the book, though, was that if the government ever tried to impose this competitive perfection on the country, then it would have the same effect on the economy as several strategically placed nuclear explosions. That's, that's my favorite line in Robert Bork's book about this. So why would he say that? Why would he say that? Well, it's because it's true. Now, I imagine. So so originally, this was only supposed to be a theory. You know, we, the, the economists were aping the scientific method of physics, and they were, they were holding all these things constant and focusing on price competition. But it almost immediately became a tool of policy. You know, you read some of the earlier writings, they said, well, yeah, we don't really, we don't really mean the government is going to force everybody to produce the same thing. But they did. They, did, they eventually went, uh, took that route. And, and develop this. And at the same time, economists became more, more uh, uh, finely tuned, more, uh, more favorably, uh, uh, had took a more favorable outlook toward antitrust regulation. Uh, the late George Stigler said uh, in one article in the American Economic Review, the reason for that was that they learned that they could make significantly more than the minimum wage as antitrust consultants. That was George Stigler. But Jack High and I took, uh, you know, we cited him in this article of ours in Economic in Inquiry. But then we said, no, we think uh, their theory of competition had a lot more to do with it than just being paid by somebody to, to, to be sort of uh, intellectual prostitutes for big business uh, or, or, or whoever. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Okay. <clears throat> so, so let's take a look at this. You know, what happened with the many firms uh, assumption you know, what does many mean? Uh, well, th this led to, in, in, uh, in the field of industrial organization, this, this led to what was called the structure conduct, I'm writing sideways here, performance paradigm. Paradigm, where competition no longer meant rivalry and entrepreneurship. It was based on market structure, how many firms in an industry, uh, and they developed concentration ratios, like a four-firm concentration ratio, for example, would be the percentage of sales uh, by the four largest firms in an industry where there might have been 10, 20, or 50 firms, something like that. And supposedly, and then there were all these studies of the supposed correlation between concentration measured with concentration ratios and profitability. And whenever they would find a positive correlation, it was just assumed that it must be cartel behavior, must be monopolistic behavior. For many years, in the 50s and 60s, there were many, many statistical studies done that said this. And when I, when I learned this in, when I was in your seat, your age, it always seemed awfully fishy to me because here we have all these supposedly scientific researchers, you know, the economics profession, and they would find a correlation. And, you know, the first thing you're taught in statistics is, is correlation is not causation. And then they would just assume the theory. The theory was uh, price fixing, cartel. And I remember learning all these oligopoly theories. You know, there's thousands, of, there seem to be thousands of them out there about, uh, in theory, this is what they might be doing. But at the same time, I understood that if entry occurs, then the, the oligopoly theories aren't worth a damn. You know, there's entry. It's not, it's not monopolistic. There's competition there. And that busts the whole thing apart, doesn't it, if there's, if there's entry into the industry. And so uh, I was always deeply suspicious of this whole thing, uh, even as a student way back when the dinosaurs were still uh, roaming the earth. We still had a couple, one or two, in my in my college town where I went to school, and uh, they were called Professor this or that, or Professor you know somebody or uh, Professor Smith, something like that. And so, but anyway, this all changed, uh, you know, because the, the understanding that mergers 
uh, do, guess what? They do what the old timers, what, what these economists that I cited a few minutes ago said they did. They created economies of scale and lower cost and lower prices for the most part. They created a type of synergy, not in every single instance, but in, in, in most instances, they created economies of scale. So if the government comes in and breaks up these companies because uh, it wants to pursue uh, manyness in, in industry, you know, less concentrated industry, uh, it'll, it risks uh, sacrificing the economies of scale. Now here's a long, long run average cost. You know, as you move down along the long run average cost curve, if, if an industry is producing here at this average cost and they're breaking up into 10 firms all this size, Q2 instead of Q1, well, you're going to sacrifice, the, you're going to have higher cost and then higher prices uh, at the same time. And, and Yale Brosen's book that I mentioned uh, uh, contains a summary of, of just dozens, maybe hundreds of these empirical studies at the time that did this. But this was all turned around in the 60s and 70s, mostly by University of Chicago researchers who did a lot of research on uh, on this whole area of the relationship between industrial concentration and profitability. Uh, Harold Demsetz uh, was a big name in this literature. And this was all very Austrian-like. They, they started looking at uh, mar the market as being more dynamic, but they didn't call themselves Austrians, I guess, for for career reasons, the Chicago schoolers. Uh, but all of this literature in Yale Brosen's book uh, is really very Austrian uh, and if you look at the way they look at competition. And Demsetz, one of the things he's known for is he found that uh, – he looked at some of the very first studies that were always cited that found a correlation between industrial concentration and profitability. And, and he, convinced, he convinced the economics profession, I think, really, that uh, the cause of that uh, has to be looked at, one. And the cause was it was invariably just better performance by one or a few firms in the, in, in the industry. That's why you found these statistical outcomes, that there are one or a few firms in all these industries that are just doing it better than everybody else, lower cost, better quality. And, and what he found, for example, uh, to put it simply, if you had an industry with a number of firms, you might have the low cost firms that have an average cost like this, and then there are the marginal firms up here. There's firm one and firm two. <clears throat> well, if there's a you know there's a market price, there's a going price in a market, let's say the the going market prices here determined by supply and demand, what these studies were picking up was the exceptional profitability of just one, two, or three firms in an industry where there might have been 10 firms. So the gap between price and average cost, in other words, the profit gap for this, the big firms here was huge, whereas this marginal firm here, you know, they're their profitability was much smaller. And so Demsetz and his, his statistical studies found that this is what was causing these, this positive correlation between uh, concentration and, uh, and uh, profitability. It wasn't a, a price-fixing conspiracy or a cartel. It was just there were two or three or four firms in this industry that were just super competitive, which is almost always the case. It's almost always the case. And then another, another piece of literature is related to this is uh, if you're interested in this area, you should look up the article by Henry Manny. <clears throat> on uh, it's called Mergers in the Market for Corporate Control. It was in the Journal of Political Economy in 1965. It's online somewhere. And uh, the late Henry Manny was here. He gave a talk here a couple of years ago. Peter Klein invited him. He was sort of a featured speaker at the Austrian. Uh, uh, the research conference that we have in March, and what Henry uh, uh, was best known for, you know, he did a lot of things. He was he was the founder of the the law and economics movement in America, pretty much. Uh, uh, first at my University of Miami, then at Emory, then at George Mason, and uh, you know. And but uh, what he's most known for was this article, I think, in the, in the academic world. And it was an, an article that explained uh, for the first time from an economic perspective what corporate takeovers were about. And, and basically, uh, I'll, I'll explain it by telling you an anecdote about uh, there was a, uh, an old television show, PBS of all things, years ago. And they had uh, as guests some corporate CEOs on one side of a table here <clears throat> and, uh, and some other 
people on the other side of the table that were corporate takeover specialists, people who specialize in corporate takeovers. Okay, and it's sort of, sort of, sort of like the foxes on one side and chickens on the other side of the, of the table. So these takeover specialists were people who would literally – you know, call up the CEO and say, your company is in play. We're buying up shares. And if we buy up enough shares, we're going to fire you and put a better management team in place because we think your firm is undervalued and poorly run. And we think if we if we become the owners and we put a new management team in there, we can increase the profits and we will make a killing because we will own a lot of the stock. And so anyway, the moderator was some dean from Harvard somewhere, and he asks – uh, one of the corp- big Fortune 500 CEOs, uh, uh, he said, what if Mr. Pickens over here, it was T. Boone Pickens, was one of the guys on the show. He was a corporate uh, raider. Uh, do you know Mr. Pickens? He's, he's waving. I'm a humble Oh, you? Okay. Anyway, I, I met T. Boone once. I was at Washington University in St. Louis for one year, and he came in and, to donate money for a conference on takeovers to Murray Wiedenbaum, who had, was my colleague there at the, at the university. And the, I'm standing there talking to Murray, and here comes T. Boone Pickens, in, in, anyway, in a, with you know, big bundles of cash in his hands, I guess, to, to finance, <laughs> finance a, a conference on takeovers. But anyway, he was on this show, and he said, what if Mr. Pickens calls you up and says, your company is in play, we're buying up shares, and uh, and you know what that means. And the CEO, you know, he huffed and puffed and he, he said, well, uh, I would call a, a meeting of the board of directors and we would decide which which of our uh, plants, factories we had to close down because they're unprofitable and shift those resources to the more profitable. And he had this big, long list of things he would do so that we could go to the shareholders and say, this is what we're doing. We're going to make money for you. And of course, that begs the question of, well, why wasn't he doing that already? You know, why was he? He wasn't doing it already because he didn't have a fire under his butt that Mr. Pickens lighted. That's why. You know, it's human nature to take the easy way of life, isn't it? And so, so the market for corporate control is really uh, a, a competitive market for management. And it, it, it helps to reduce the slack, the managerial inefficiency. There was a, an old, old Harvard economist years ago, his name was Harvey Leibenstein. He invented probably the ugliest term in economics, ex inefficiency. Just how, how unimaginative is that? He, he had this theory. It means managerial motivational inefficiency, laziness. I always thought it was, you know, how unimaginative is that X? You know, when you think of something better, but, but that's what it was. So there's, for a while, there was a literature in economics about X inefficiency. And well, what, what the market for corporate control does is, is to, to discipline that, to eliminate that to some, to some extent. And so, so that's what Henry Manny is most, most known for. And so the, the many firms assumption was really went down the tubes as, as something to worry about. The whole structure conduct performance paradigm was uh, very successfully attacked in the academic world, mostly by the Chicago School Economists, but also by the Austrians. Uh, Dominic Armentano's book was very influential in that regard, in, in my opinion. And so, uh, and so the government, even to this day, the U.S. government, is not quite as zany as it once was with respect to uh, regulating mergers. It does a lot of bad things. It's, it's government, after all. But it's not nearly as out of control. It was so out of control in the Carter administration that the Democratic Congress defunded the Federal Trade Commission as an act of protest because there were there were just, you know, there was a recession. Unemployment was what, 13 percent or something like that. And here's the Federal Trade Commission suing companies trying to become more competitive by merging and not allowing them to, to do that. While the Japanese competitors were doing the exact same thing and becoming more competitive and, and cleaning their clocks. And so, so that's what they did. Okay, the second, uh, you know, this other assumption, homogeneous prices and homogeneous products, rather. Homogeneous products. You know, this, this led to the uh, monopolistic competition revolution, which is one of my favorite oxymorons, monopolistic competition. It's kind of like uh, jumbo shrimp, military intelligence. You know, if you... <laughs> If you don't like country music, country music. If you don't like hip hop music, hip hop. You know, you, you get you get the idea. You know, two words that are the opposite: homo, monopolistic competition. And so, and, and this was developed by you know, Edward Chamberlain and Joan Robinson, two British economists, wrote pretty much the same book at the same time in the 30s. 
And of course, the idea was, well, you could still have many firms, but if they all differentiate their product a little bit, they're all really monopolies because they're, that's, that's what a monopoly is, a single firm producing a, a single product. And so they, they came up with a theory of monopolistic competition. And there was, and that translated into a lot of government regulatory policy that became very suspicious of product differentiation. Uh, and so product differentiation, it was, you know, in the world of the Austrians, it's just a natural type of competitive uh, advantage trying to differentiate your product, uh, making it a little better, making, making it a little more appealing. You don't know it's going to be better, but you try it out and see what works. You know, you use your best, uh, your best knowledge that you can, you can gather. Okay. And so there was always this suspicion. So what, what there was, what was being said theoretically was, I guess I already drew this graph. I don't need to draw it again. Here's a, a sloppy uh, rendition of the monopoly graph from, <clears throat> from your principal's textbook with uh, you know, demand and marginal revenue and a constant cost industry, a marginal cost, average cost. And what the theory was, uh, what, what was being said here is that, well, you know, if you, uh, if you do differentiate your product or invent a new product, you're a monopoly. You're going to produce, you're going to produce at the monopoly price and you're going to produce this quantity output right here with them circling. Whereas if this was competitive, here's the competitive level of output. Marginal cost would be the supply curve, and here's here's the quantity of output. So there's going to be an output restriction and a deadweight loss, standard story, uh, and, and monopoly profits created by innovation and product differentiation. Okay, this is not the monopolistic competition graph, but this is... This is the same idea of what they were they were talking about, and so anyway, what, but what 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 the Austrians would see at this? Let's see a little look at this. If you use this graph, sort of the mainstream uh, uh, neoclassical economics graph, um, this is a, a, a case, an example of the what's known as the Nirvana fallacy. Nirvana fallacy. Because this equilibrium here, this the competitive equilibrium, can only be achieved if everybody had the same idea at the same time about this new product, the, the, the new product we're talking about, the, create, the newly innovated product. If everybody had the idea at the same time, this would be the quantity of output. But only one company, only one entrepreneur had the idea, so this is the, the uh, level of output. So what the fallacy is, is when you compare the real world to some utopian ideal that is never achievable, and then you condemn the real world for being imperfect. Okay, it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a fallacy. Okay, and you can always you can condemn it, you can condemn everything about the free market by doing that because it's not perfectly competitive, as Robert Bork said. If we try to do that, then you might as well blow up the country with nuclear bombs. I mean, same effect. And so the real comparison here is how much output did you have before the invention, before the new product was created? Well, here's the answer right here. You had zero. They create the, the new product and you get this much. Okay, now, since we're measuring quantity in this direction, to me, that looks like an output expansion, not an output restriction, doesn't it? It looks like there's more consumer surplus, not less consumer surplus. There's more benefit to the customer who voluntarily buys this product. And then, of course, competition will eventually rush in, and this price will fall and be be more competitive. More 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 products will be, will be created. And so, if you take the Austrian view of competition being a dynamic, rivalrous process, you wouldn't buy into this. But this was uh, this became a part of government policy in the United States. Uh, in, the, in the antitrust area, there's a famous uh, antitrust case that's known as the Serials case. This was in the late 1970s, where the uh, in the early 80s, where the Federal Trade Commission sued General Mills, Kellogg's, and General Foods for what they said was brand proliferation. It was also brand proliferation at the same time. And they claimed that that created a shared monopoly. 
Now, it wasn't a regular monopoly. It was a shared monopoly by these three big companies, so the government said. And they hired a prestigious uh, Harvard University uh, economics professor whose textbook, his name is Friedrich Scherer, whose his textbook was widely used in all, all the courses at the time in industrial organization all over the play, all over the world. Uh, to be there. He's the one who came up with this theory of brand proliferation. So what had happened was these three companies had just experimented with all different types of dry cereal, and some of them really caught on, and they made a lot of money, and they had 70% market share among these three companies. And so just that fact that they had a 70% market share was enough for the government to sue and drag them into court for years and make them spend many millions of dollars on legal fees uh, on, on this. Uh, in the end, the companies won the lawsuit. They went all the way up to the Supreme Court. They prevailed. But with antitrust, even when you win, you lose because you had to divert management talent for years away from running your business to dealing with the government and lawyer. And you had to hire lawyers and lawyers and you know, more than you know, tons of lawyers instead of managers and engineers and marketing people and finance people. And you had to, you had to do that. And so, uh, and the judge in the case, I can paraphrase him. Uh, you know, made the common sense uh, statement as, uh, I don't even like dry cereal. I eat bacon and eggs in the morning. And he was saying, well, even if they did raise the price, there are a lot, a heck of a lot of substitutes for uh, dry cereal. So how could they be a monopoly? And you know, that's, that's sort of a pedestrian way of saying what he said. So, 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 so these theories, you know, these aren't just theories that, uh, that are harmless and in the textbook. They, they've caused some real problems. Homogeneous prices, that assumption, <clears throat> of course, that supposedly is an equilibrium, even though the world is never in equilibrium. And there are a lot of reasons for why firms charge different prices at different, at different, different times. The intensity of demand. Uh, when I first moved to Baltimore many, many years ago, to, when I was teaching at Loyola, I lived downtown on Federal Hill in, in the city. And... Uh, Every, and I lived in a townhouse, and every night when I get home from work, there'd be a, a ton of junk mail in my in my uh, mailbox, and I was uh, I was I marveled at it because uh, half of it would be really great food deals from somewhere in Baltimore. It'd be like the latest pizza joint that opened up. It would be large pizza sub sandwich and thirty two ounce Coke for a dollar. So, not a dollar, but it would be like six bucks or some ridiculously low price, you know, feed a family of ten for six dollars. And they would do that for a, a couple of weeks. I'd get the I'd get this. And so so you could easily put on twenty pounds in a couple of weeks if you if you went to all these places <laughs> over there like this. But then after a while you'd find that they charge the same price as everybody else. And so what they were doing is if you're the new one on the new kid on the block, how do you get people in your pizza shop or your sub shop? Well, you have to offer them a, an enticing deal. And so that's one reason why you often see different prices at different times. You know, you, know, you don't see homogeneous prices. And, and there, there are a lot of reasons you know, for that. Okay, the, the perfect information assumption has also led to a lot of mischief because after all, if you, if you had a world of, if you took that seriously, there would be no such thing as advertising. You wouldn't need advertising, would you? Because in, in a perfect e a competition, there's perfect information. And so advertising was always looked at as being suspicious or a, a barrier to entry. Although in, in, the, in economics, in this whole field of industrial organization, there, there were many uh, studies around the same time when the Chicago School was real active with the, the merger studies in the 70s and 80s, uh, beginning in the 60s. There were a, a bunch of very interesting studies that looked at what happens to prices of products when uh, advertising is temporarily banned for some reason. For example, there's one study... Uh, they looked at a newspaper strike in New York City where you could no longer, this was before the internet, before, where you could no longer shop for groceries by just picking up the newspaper and seeing what hamburger costs at this versus the other grocery store and things like that. And they did a, <clears throat> an, an event study and, and found that lo and behold, during the, during the, gro uh, the strike, uh, the newspaper strike, uh, prices of all these groceries shot up and then as soon as the strike was over and you could read the advertised prices again, prices went down. Uh, one of the first studies was by an economist named Lee Benham, B-E-N-H-A-M. Uh, he found that optometrists in some states could advertise for eyeglasses, and in other states it was illegal. 
to advertise for eyeglasses. This, this is the old the old days. It's it's that's no longer true, but it was once like that. And so he had a natural experiment there, where you know about twenty some states banned the advertising of eyeglasses. And so he looked at this theory. Well, is advertising a barrier to entry, which therefore causes higher prices? Uh, or not, uh, or is advertising a source of information that helps us shop, it helps us comparison shop, and if it does that, it's it's likely to lead to lower prices, even though it's expensive to pay for advertising, it's cost of doing business like everything else is, and what he found was that in those states that banned advertising, all other things equal, he controlled for all these other variables, the prices were prices were higher as a result of the ban. You know, just just think of how, how much harder it would be for you to shop for things if you couldn't go online on, and use Amazon, for for example, and find out and compare the prices offered on Amazon to the prices offered everywhere else. And all the, you know, the retail stores all have their own websites now. And so in the world today where we have, uh, you know, advertising has gone wild now because you can, you can comparison shop on the web. Uh, you know, but 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, that wasn't true. And so... Uh, so that assumption, too, though, nevertheless, still created a lot of mischief in the attempts to regulate advertising, banning billboards. A lot of the, the uh, banning of billboards and things was sort of insidious because it was sort of a, a bootleggers and Baptist type of co political coalition. You know, our friend Bruce Yandel coined that phrase, I think, bootleggers and Baptists. During Prohibition, the bootleggers were for it because they made money selling booze illegally, and the Baptists were for it because they b believed you would go to hell if you drank alcohol. And so bootleggers and Baptists. But, but in, in the examples of advertising, you had such things as the Holiday Inn Corporation, teaming up with environmentalist organizations to ban roadside advertising billboards because it it made the interstates ugly, the billboards. Okay. Now you could either Holiday Inns was being, you know, environmentally sensitive, or they were being greedy as usual, with the understanding that if you're on the interstate, you're on your five hundred mile trip to visit mom and dad and you're looking for a hotel, and you see a sign that says, uh, sleep in, 19.95 a night, okay, you might give it a try. But if there are no signs, and you can't, uh, and this is before the internet, by the way, I'm, I'm talking, now, now you can just get on your phone and find out what, what's out there. Then at the Holiday Inn, you basically know what you're going to get. You're going to get a reasonably clean room with not too many roaches, and uh, and stay away from the pool. There are too many kids in it, and uh, you get your stale breakfast, and and it's moderately fifty nine bucks, something like that. But still, that's more than nineteen ninety nine, isn't it? And so it was obviously in the interest of the Holiday Inn acting as the bootleggers to ban billboard advertising. And the, the environmentalists, well, for their reasons, well, yeah, they didn't want billboards. They just wanted you to look at grass uh, as you drive. No, I'm not advertising. You know, look at the grass, how nice it is. And so uh, and so it's it's the banning of or regulation of advertising uh, that is uncompetitive, not advertising. And, of course, the free entry and exit, I always thought, even as an undergraduate, I thought there's something screwy about that. Because, you know, I was taught in chapter one of micro that there's no such thing as a free lunch, you know, because of scarcity. How could anything be free because of scarcity, economic scarcity? And so, you know, that has always been problematic, free entry, you know, free, you know, nothing free. Okay, now another, one of my favorite points that uh, Murray Rothbard makes about the, the mainstream model of competition is his discussion of output restriction, you know, on that graph... Uh, that's the great condemnation of monopoly output restriction. You know, monopolies produce this where my thumb finger is here instead of this, this amount of output. They restrict the output. But not really. You know, if, if, a, if, a, if one industry does restrict output below what it would have been, then those resources that are no longer being used will be used in some other industry. So there's going to be an expansion of output somewhere else, but not even, even if there is a re reduction in output in this one industry. So you cannot say on a global level that there has been a, an output restriction. And beside that, um, here, here's a question. This, this might be on the written exam. How many times a year does the average ultimate fighting fighter fight? Who watches ultimate fighting? Any, any of these people watch this where these guys break each other's legs and arms and 
and things. Uh, I, I've never watched this one fighter the whole time, but I thought it was a couple times. A couple times a year? Uh, Depending on what, how, how far you go up. You think well, maybe five? No, 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 no. Three times? Three times a year? Well, they're obviously restricting output, aren't they? Because if you ever saw that movie Fight Club with Brad Pitt, they fought every night. Every single night. And so three times a year, they're restricting output. Why does Major League Baseball only play 161 games? They could play a few more, couldn't they? Pro football, what a bunch of loafers. 16 games a year? And these guys make, some of them make $25 million a year in salary. And so they're obviously restricting output. Okay, and I, you know, I only teach two courses a semester. I could probably teach five if I had to, but I only teach two a semester. I'm restricting output. You know, we're all restricting output. And so, you know, when you look at this output restriction as, you know, the, the definition of what you should look for in monopoly, you know, it, it can, become a, can become absurd. Uh, uh, when I've given this talk before, I mentioned a, a conference I was at, an antitrust conference in Washington, D.C., where a Federal Trade Commission economist was giving a talk bragging about what they were doing. And at the time, he said they were, they were uh, about to prosecute the Detroit automobile dealers because it was in the wintertime, they closed down at 5 p.m. And he, he said they suspected that, that was an output restriction. They were, they were colluding to restrict the supply of automobile sales services by closing at 5 p.m., but I don't know about you, but uh, how many of you would, would would think that in the winter in Detroit, downtown Detroit, you would feel comfortable walking around looking for a car, looking to buy a car, car the snow and the cold and all that? You know, how many customers do you think they would have had to to justify paying all the people, all the mechanics and everybody to be at work until nine o'clock? All the salespeople, the lights are on, and and everything else, and so. And so it, I did ask this guy, does that mean that economic efficiency requires forced labor? Because what else would you call it if the government told these people you have to stay open until 9 o'clock other than forced labor? And didn't we outlaw that with the 13th Amendment to the Constitution in 1866, yeah, forced labor? And so uh, and, and he didn't say anything. He didn't, he didn't know what to say. But it's true. I think mean, it, it, it's true. Let me give you some examples of what, uh, you know, armed with this, these theories and worse, uh, we've seen with, with antitrust, some of the more famous cases, you know, one of the most famous early antitrust cases was the Standard Oil, Standard Oil case where John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil was sued in 1895 and, they, and they, they were in court until 1911. So 16 years he had to uh, ha hassle with the government. <clears throat> but and what what was he guilty of? He was guilty of dropping the price of refined uh, petroleum from thirty cents a gallon in eighteen sixty nine to eight cents a gallon. You know because and and even uh, Rockefeller's harshest critics, such as Ida Tarbell, who wrote the history of the Standard Oil Company, she called the the Rockefeller organization a quote marvelous example of economy, and, and it was. So, so Rockefeller became the richest man in the world by dropping the price of refined petroleum for decades, certain decades, inventing new products. They created hundreds of new products from the residue from petroleum, employed hundreds of thousands of people at the early 20th century. And for that, his company was broken up by the, by the federal government. General Motors, for years, instructed its managers to not uh, ever get more than a 40% market share for fear of being sued by the federal government for violating the antitrust laws. So, they, so the managers were told, don't make the cars that good, so good, and so inexpensive that we'll get a 50% market share because we don't want to be like John D. Rockefeller and spend 11 years you know, uh, uh, in court with, with, the, with the government. Pan American Airlines was bankrupted by the government because the government refused to allow them to have domestic routes, feeder routes. Pan Am flew internationally, and they wanted feeder routes. So if they had a flight from Miami to London, they wanted to have a feeder flight from Atlanta to Miami to bring customers to go to their international flight. The government prohibited them from doing that. They went out, they went out of business. Uh, the famous Alcoa case, Aluminum Company of America, they were sued in 1937 for supposedly monopolizing the uh, the aluminum ingot market. Now, the judge 
the judge who issued the decision against them was named Learned Hand. If you, if you, if you ever become a judge, I, this is a great name for a judge, Learned Hand. So if you ever become a judge, you might want to consider changing your name to that. To that, he's long dead, so he doesn't need that name anymore. So, but here's here are some of the things he said in his decision to find Alcoa guilty, even though they had hundreds of competitors at the time. They were guilty of, quote, having superior skill, foresight, and industry. And, and, with, and all of this was exclusionary. They, they excluded their competitors from making money because of their superior skill, foresight, and industry. He also condemned them for, quote, efficiently supplying a demand, okay? And also, quote, embracing every new opportunity that came along. So, he, so just like with Rockefeller, this judge said that they were just super competitive and just the best, better than anybody. It's, it's serving their customers. Therefore, they need to, we need to find them. Uh, and, you know, with, with antitrust laws in the United States, the penalties are called treble damages. So, so if some judge decides that Alcoa inflicted uh, $100 million worth of damage, quote, damage on competitors, then the fine would be $300 million that they would have to pay. And... and uh, as far as that goes, IBM was was sued in 1968 for monopolizing the uh, the computer industry. They were in court until 1983, when the judge uh, the judge died, and the, and the government and, and the government said the hell with it, <laughs> because to and that, but in the meantime, Microsoft and Apple and all these other companies had totally eclipsed IBM and had just eaten their lunch competitively. So the whole thing was moot. And so they just gave up uh, all to, altogether with it. American Tobacco, 1911, they were sued. This was a company formed by James Duke, the founder of Duke University. You know, you probably, if I were to give this talk at Duke, I would probably have to first uh, inform the students of where the nearest safe room was to let them know, know that the founder of their university was a tobacco baron. But uh, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, but, uh, but here's what uh, the court that the court said when they condemned American tobacco. Quote: There has not been any increase in the price. And quote: There's been no unfair competition. I'm still quoting: The volume of output had enormously increased. And I'm no longer quoting, but they had thousands of competitors producing cigarettes, thousands. And the actual price of cigarettes fell. They were sued in uh, 1895. And the price was $2.70 uh, a carton, and it went down to two twenty. dollars And that's what, that's what created the lawsuit. They, they, the price had gone down uh, that much, and that generated the lawsuit. So what you often see with the antitrust cases is sour grapes competitors are the instigators. Whenever you see a government lawsuit, it's the it's the competitors who who are unable or unwilling to compete and lower their prices, who instigate the the uh, their member of Congress to get the Federal Trade Commission or the Antitrust Division of the uh, Justice Department to step in and sue their competitors. You know, I had MBA students who have told me who work for real estate developers who told me, you know, whenever they build a golf course on one of their developments it's guaranteed they're going to be sued for unfair competition because their competitors don't have a golf course on their on their housing developments, th things like that. This was in Maryland when I taught MBA students in Maryland. And so it's, it's routinely used to, to, to uh, reduce competition, to attack competition. Okay, that's why, uh, you know, Dominic Armentano uh, in, in his great book uh, was so eloquently... Uh, uh, trashed antitrust regulation, he looked at the 55 most famous federal cases and found that in every single one, every single one, no exceptions, the companies were doing what mainstream economists say is competitive. They were dropping prices, expanding output, inventing new products, and, and, and just competing, every single one. And they were all sued for violating the antitrust laws. And this theory, the perfect competition theory and the structured conduct performance model that came from it was used, has, has been used for decades 
as the theoretical justification for all this, just as Keynesianism is used as the theoretical justification for deficit spending and fine-tuning and central planning with fiscal policy and monetary policy. This is the sort of the, the industrial organization version of Keynesianism, the perfect competition model. And it came about at the same time, the 1930s. The 1930s when capitalism was blamed for the Great Depression. And this is what this is how the economics profession responded by inventing Keynesianism and the perfect competition model to justify all this massive interventionism.